I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Paula Lomas. I am Senior Director of Clinical Communications at the CF Foundation, and I've had that role for a little over four years. But I started in CF in 1988 as a nurse coordinator in a pediatric care center. I stayed in PAIDS for a while. I started out on Long Island. I used to say different. You might hear that in my accent. Uh, and then I moved to adult care, and I even had a stint as research coordinator. So I've done a lot of different things in CF nursing, and I've seen a lot of great changes. So um, it's really a great privilege of mine to be here with you and talk about mental health and what we're doing to support that work. And I wanted to make sure that my co-moderator, uh, Ginger Birnbaum, got to introduce herself and welcome you as well. Thank you, Paula. I am just really excited that we get the opportunity to be here with all of you today and shine an even brighter light on emotional wellness and also um, the work of the Mental Health Advisory Committee, of which I have the tremendous privilege to be a part. Um, in, in 2015, and, and Paula will go into this more, at NACFC, the, the science conference, um, I heard the plenary in it was, there is no health without mental health. And that rang so true with me. For most of my life, I've felt very passionate about emotional wellness and mental health and how um, the better balanced we are, you could say, or the more comfortable we are with that, um, the more we can build up from there. So it was amazing to me that the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation had so strongly committed to having a focus in that area for the community. And I also want to say to those um, that are joining us online, you so much are a part of this. And uh, we hope that you feel very connected to everyone here in the room since we are a community and we're excited to share with you all of this today as well. I'm going to pass it back to Paula. I should say my role at the foundation is to make sure that care teams have the information that they need um, in order to provide high quality specialized care, the care that is required for cystic fibrosis. And so one of the things that we provide for care teams is a framework of care and that is through our clinical care guidelines. And mental health falls under that um, umbrella. So. I wanted to say that what we will be doing today is giving you a little background and uh, talking about what we are working um, towards with the Mental Health Advisory Committee and what we plan on doing. But we wanted to leave a lot of time in order to hear from you and hear your questions and hopefully give some answers, but also maybe some ideas and maybe some gaps that you have noticed and things that we need to bring back to the Mental Health Advisory Committee and take a look at for the future. If you do not um, like to speak in front of people, then you can uh, put your question in onto the website, and that is vlc.cnf.io. Uh, we will ask that if you have a question or a comment, and I'm going to be a stickler about this, that you come up to the microphone because we have people watching online and they won't be able to hear you otherwise. So we ask that you do that. You know, each of us, each of us in this room, our well-being is influenced by our physical health as well as our mental health. That's for everyone. And each of us have to deal with times of anxiety and maybe some times of depression. And that's really part of being a human being. And we know that individuals who deal with a chronic illness, like cystic fibrosis, as well as their parent caregivers, are going to have times of anxiety and depression. Because it, it really is a normal response to a very challenging situation. But we didn't know the prevalence of anxiety and depression in our community until we took a look at the TIDE study. TIDE stands for the International Depression Slash Anxiety Epidemiological Study. And the CF Foundation funded this study. It took place in 45 US care centers. I like to say we were that star in New Jersey. Um, and eight European countries. And what we found was yes. 
adolescents and adults with CF did have a higher rate of anxiety and depression, and so did their parent caregivers. And in fact, this was two to three times greater than the general population. I have up here the prevalence of anxiety, but the results were very similar for depression. So this was for both anxiety and depression that our community, our adults and uh, adolescents with CF and the parent caregivers had a two to three times greater prevalence of anxiety as well as depression. So this was a call to action for us. What were we going to do with this information? And what we did was we joined forces with the European CF Society and we convened a group of experts to take a look at the data, to uh, analyze the evidence, and they came back with what we call the mental health guidelines. Well, mental health is really a big umbrella. And they had to, and they did decide to focus on one piece, and they said that they were going to start out with anxiety and depression. And so although we call these the mental health guidelines, they really are just guidelines for screening and treating anxiety and depression. These guidelines are available on cff.org. If you like to read the full guideline, you can do so. It's there. But some people, they don't want to read the whole thing. And so what we have is an executive summary, and that's on cff.org, and it has key recommendations. And the recommendation was that those who were ages 12 and older should be screened at least annually, and that those who um, were 17 and younger, their parents should be offered screening. So that was the recommendation. And then, based on the screening, uh, the, uh, they would be either referred for treatment or maybe that intervention would take place at the care center. And so those were the mental health guidelines. But where guidelines often fail is in the implementation. We can give that framework, we can make the recommendations, but putting into practice is often where it's difficult. And Bruce Marshall knew that this was probably going to be the case. And actually, he mentioned that yesterday when he spoke about this. And so what he did was he brought together some of those individuals that were on the guidelines committee, and he worked with a task force, and he asked them to come with recommendations uh, from that group. And what they said was they recommended the collaborative care model. That meant that somebody would be part of the care team that would be responsible for the screening, would be responsible for either referral or treatment. And so we then um, provided seed funding for mental health coordinators to care centers who applied and received uh, funding. That was in 2015, 2016, and 2018. And to date, we have funded 138 uh, mental health coordinator grants. We know, ah, that is good. We know not every care center received a grant. We know that's disappointing to many. Um, but we're trying to figure out ways in which we can help everyone with CF in regards to mental health. And another thing that we decided to do was uh, convene the Mental Health Advisory Committee. And I'd like um, to ask Ginger to come up and talk to you about being part of that Mental Health Advisory Committee. Hi. Um, so yeah, this is the Mental Health Advisory Committee, and the way that I've had the great privilege to be a part of it is not because I'm a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a social worker or even a nurse. Um, I am a mother, and I'm a part of this with all of you, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. Mothers are all of those. Mothers are all of those. It's a very good point. It's a very good point. Um, so I have the privilege of being part of this foundation with you, and, and one of the things that we have, which is such a gift, is community voice. And we spoke about that some yesterday on another panel. So through community voice, you can express your interest to work together with researchers and clinicians, and sometimes there will be opportunities like this. You can give as much or as little time as you like. As I said earlier, mental health is something that I'm very passionate about. So I wanted to give a lot of my time to it because I see it as a very big need. And so this has been a gift to me to get to work with 
all of these incredible people. Um, we have three buckets for this mental health advisory committee or three work groups. Education and training, which is what I, I focus on, consultation and research. And I, I just want to point out to all of you, and I hope that you will trust in this, these people are experts. They are just incredible. The wealth of information and experience that they have and what they are bringing to the cystic fibrosis community is incredible that we have them forming this committee. And, and having me a part of it too, and having someone that's living with cystic fibrosis on the committee and just listening to what is actually needed in this community is a great gift. So we have um, the mental health toolkit, and we believe it's important to have this toolkit because like Paula was saying, we have these grants, mental health coordinators in some care centers, but if we just put them out there and don't give them the resources to thrive and the information to use when they're speaking with all of you, they will not be as successful. So there's this mental health toolkit. You can see some of the pieces here. Um, there's also a dedicated email address, and we even have a Dropbox where things are constantly being updated, constantly being added. Um, that's to say that if you have dealt with your mental health coordinator, they are getting new resources a lot of the time, so be sure that you're keeping in touch with them too. Um, the guidelines and, uh, on depression and anxiety are outlined on cff.org, um, and many of the things that are developed um, through the Mental Health Advisory Committee are pulled through onto cff.org. So then it's more community facing, right? It's not just in your care center. So there are some pieces there and I would really urge you to dig in. I said earlier when we had this session that a lot of times you go to a landing page on a website and it looks like there are six or seven things there. But if you take the time to click on that find the other hyperlink, find all the different levels of information, I think you will be surprised by how much is out there that you can readily get your hands on and begin to use and just learn more about what is going on here. I'm going to pass it back to Paula. Yeah, the Mental Health Advisory Committee is made up of psychiatrists, psychologists, nurses, social workers, a few individuals with CF, parents, and physicians. So it really is um, a multidisciplinary group. They, everybody has full-time jobs. So what they're doing for us is really because of their love for this community and their, um, their support and their commitment to this work. We knew that we had a lot of new community members when we had the mental health coordinator grant. We had a lot of new mental health coordinators joining our community. And so the education um, group has done a lot of work in making sure that they have a special class for those new mental health coordinators at the North American Conference so that they have the tools and resources that they need. But one tool and resource that was developed at the end of last year, and I wanted to mention it, is um, the resiliency handout. And I thought with some of the things that were mentioned yesterday that this might be something that would be important to mention here. And that is to remember that resilience means the ability to bounce back. It doesn't mean that you don't deal with stress. On that resiliency handout, it does call out those times that are stressful when your child is admitted to the hospital, when you're waiting for sputum culture results. Um, this resiliency handout is for the caregiver, parent, spouse, just for you to be able to understand that's important for you to rejuvenate, right? It's very difficult to always give if you're empty. So it's important for you to um, take a look at that. It has some examples of ways for self-care. And it also says in it, don't feel guilty. Don't feel guilty about taking that time for self-care. So I, I, I felt with a couple of things that were mentioned yesterday that that would be something to say to you. If you were at a chapter, this is available um, 
to you. You can order it on Workplace. I just want to make sure I mention that. Maybe this would be something that you would like to have at your CFF CARES events um, or just to have available for your families. It is available on CFF.org. All of these um, tools are on CFF.org. Uh, and it, this particular one would be found with the coping while caring with somebody with cystic fibrosis, so you can find it there. So the other work group, the consultation work group, they recognized that they needed to support one another. And so what we have done for them, the CF Foundation, we've given them the virtual platform, but they've met together. They started um, learning more about cognitive behavioral therapy in the recommendations that was recommended as a first line therapy for anxiety or depression. And uh, so they meet together and they have continued to meet, and now what they plan to do is talk about really tough cases and also learn from each other, learn from each other about the referral pathway, um, how to do that better, how to find ways to pay for uh, mental health um, services. So that is what the consultation groups have been. We also understand that the sustainability for the mental health coordinator grant is an issue. Right, we gave seed funding, three-year seed funding, but how were care centers going to sustain that position? It's a challenge. And so we put together a Billing 101 document as well as some sustainability resources for teams so that they can figure out a way of um, funding this position. We also have a mentoring program for this group where we have a seasoned mental health coordinator matched with someone who is newer to the community, and they learn from each other. And what the mentoring um, program helps with is it's not just a one and done. It really is a relationship that they build and that they can help each other. And that less, the newer mental health coordinator goes to the site, goes to that mental health coordinator's um, site and really learns on the ground how, how that uh, position is worked out. We've also started a telebehavioral health pilot. This is something that we started in January. We've learned that telehealth is something that we need to look into and that 80% of telehealth is actually telebehavioral health. So it makes sense for us to start looking at this area and maybe what we learn can be shared with others. We have partnered with the Telebehavioral Health Institute and um, we're looking, we will have much more information and maybe we'll be able to share more next year. We have tried to help care teams in the step-by-step -step approach of screening for anxiety and depression, as well as um, the tools, offering them tools so that they can just go in and take what is um, useful for them and we do this through a mental health change package. Change package is terminology that's used in quality improvement. And uh, so we try and implement and offer quality improvement methodology through our change package. And the consultation group put this together and it is available to any care center, whether they have a mental health coordinator or not. And we also have offered them the uh, mental health screening tracking log. You can only imagine if you have to screen somebody every year and then you refer or maybe you implement a treatment. You have to keep track of that. And if you have to rescreen them, you have to know who is it that you're rescreening. So we are trying to make this as uh, easy as possible for care teams. And so we worked with our registry team to build out this mental health screening tracking log. It, really is a super Excel spreadsheet and teams are able to see trends and uh, follow, know who they need to follow up with and uh, we thank the registry team. This is something for care teams to use. It does, none of this information goes back to the CF Foundation. I like to make sure that I say that because sometimes people think, well, we didn't consent to that. It, this is all for the care teams to use and really to make things a little easier for them. So what have we seen? Well, um, when we take a look at our registry data, we see that the, um, uh, the guidelines were published 
in October of 2015. And so we saw an increase in screening in 2016 in both anxiety and depression, and then even a greater um, increase in screening in 2017. I haven't seen the 2018 data yet. That um, data was only locked at the beginning of the month, but we should have that information for you very soon. And I, I think that that is just going to continue to increase. I think that we're going to see an increase in 2018 because of this. Because when we look at the data from the Patient and Family Experience of Care Survey, we see from 2015 up to 2018 that adults with CF, as well as parents, recognize that their teens are asking them more about mental health. If you don't know about the Patient and Family Experience of Care Survey, it is a survey that is deployed through one of our third-party vendors to patients and families um, no more than twice a year after a clinic visit. So that's what the Experience of Care Survey is, and we've seen great improvement, and actually it is the most improved metrics on the Experience of Care Survey, and that's around mental health, so we're happy to see that. Yes? Why only twice a year? Well, a lot of it is, with the Experience of Care Survey, well, a lot of it is survey fatigue. We have a hard time even getting people to complete it once a year. So it, it's sent out twice a year um, based on when your clinic visit is, and, th and that's really the bottom line answer, that we've had a hard time for people even completing it once a year. They, I think they want you to use, and I also think maybe we're talking about two different things, but go ahead, you finish. Yeah, you're talking about, you know, we have this survey twice a year, and obviously that's relying on a lot of people to actually fill out the survey for one and self-report these issues, but let's be honest, there is a stigma with mental health that a lot of people may or may not answer those 100% truthfully. Um, why, I guess I'm wondering, is there a way that we can do this within the, the clinic visit and make this much more of a actual... Um, you know, a part of the actual care yeah. and have a, a, a professional that is guiding them through this. And, 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 yeah, I, so what you're asking, yeah, you're talk, we're talking about two different surveys. Okay. So okay. that's a great question because then I didn't make myself clear. So I appreciate that, that you asked the question very much. People are screened for anxiety and depression using a validated tool at, in the care center with a mental health professional or with their social worker or their nurse. So that's separate from their experience of care survey is a 20 question survey asking how, how clean was your, your, the hospital, um, things like that. And one of the questions was, were you asked about your mental health? Good, good thank you. So I'm, I'm very glad you asked that question. <laughs> we'll get through it. Um, all right. So one way we think that maybe we can help um, with the prevention of some mental health issues is through CF Peer Connect. Um, this will not take the place of mental health counseling, and I don't want you to think that I think that it does. But wouldn't it be important and wouldn't it be better if we did what we could to prevent these issues? If we connected someone with CF, with somebody who also was trained as a peer mentor and could be somebody that they would connect with and have conversations with. That could be not just for an adult with CF, but now this is for family members and it goes down to age 16, so it would also be available to siblings if they would be interested. And I asked Ginger if she would share at least a story or two that she's heard about how CF Peer Connect has helped um, those of you in the community. So, admittedly, CF Peer Connect is one of the very, very few resources that I have yet to take advantage of. 
um, and I, to my knowledge that my husband has taken it has not taken advantage of but more recently after working um, as part of a panel to present yesterday and discuss CF peer connect community voice compass different ways that, that the community t can take advantage of these services I realized what an invaluable resource CF peer connect can be in the community because I started hearing these stories and like so many things Things. You hear about something once, you learn about it a little bit, and then your ears perk up every time you hear it. And these stories kind of start to build, and you realize, wow, you're really hearing a lot about that, you know, once you're aware of it. So the first story that um, I heard was through Linda Farrington, who's given me her permission, to, um, to, to share what she said and just how much it impacted me, um, which I think also speaks a lot to CF Peer Connect. There could be, you know, perhaps one thing that you're talking to someone about, but it, it can impact people across many different levels. So Linda had, had discussed that, you know, if you are a spouse, you're in the hospital, it's a weekend, it gets very lonely, it gets very quiet, you have certain concerns, anxieties can build, really, you're on your own, right, if you're feeling those things within yourself. But if you can connect to someone else and have them shoulder some of that burden with you to support you, it can make a tremendous difference. For me, when I heard Linda talking about that, it just immediately brought me back to being in the hospital with my little boy, King. And during the week, things are very, very busy. It's like rapid fire. There's so many people in and out of the room, checking this, checking that. And somehow, I don't know exactly how it happens, but on the weekends, it just gets eerily quiet. It's not as busy, there's not as much foot traffic, and there you are, you're in a hospital room on a Saturday night when maybe just even the previous Saturday night you were out to dinner, right? That's such a drastic difference. And your typical friend that's stopping by to bring you dinner or whatever, they're not really going to understand maybe how that feels unless they've been through it. So speaking with someone else that has been in that situation and can really talk to you on, in such a personal way and in such a credible way because they've lived it could have such an impact. So that's, that's the first story that I heard from Linda, and it just it, it really resonated with me. And so I'm so grateful that she shared that and um, allowed me to share that with you. So after I heard that story, I started to think, wow, this Peer Connect thing, this is really like, that's amazing. This is an amazing resource. We're at VLC and Drew Struby, who also has said that I could share his story, um, stood up and you all heard him and he's talking about the impact on dads or men in the CF community that might be a spouse, a sibling, um, a, a friend even maybe that is having a really hard time because it's sometimes just harder for men, right? Um, I'm a part of a CF moms group on, on social media and the chatter in that group is constant. I, I, I see the laughing. I, I know that, that some of you are in there too. So it's, it's like anything you ever want to know, you can jump on there and, and, you know, get information, whether you choose to use it or not, it's totally up to you, but you can get some input, right? I don't know that in the same way that that's available for dads. Um, there is a CF dads group. There is a CF dads group. Now, Alex is okay with this, I think. My husband, Alex, did not know about the CF Dads group. When you're a CF mom, you can barely get off the phone when they tell you this test came back positive and 10 people have messaged you and they're like, join the CF moms group, it's gonna be great. So dads don't always know about it as much. The, the flow of information is not as free. So to hear Drew talking about that and to see how passionate he was about it, to hear him say, wow, this has impacted me so much to see that there are other men in this community that really need this support. This is one of the ways that they can get this support. And after hearing these two stories, I can only imagine how much further this resource can go for all of us. And I know it's something that I am 
eager to get home and look into and just see what kind of impact it can have on our lives. So I would encourage you to do the same. So let's talk about what we've built out on CFF.org that's available to you at any time, 24-7, right? Um, in 2017, we really did focus on depression and anxiety. And like I said, this, that was just a starting point, and we recognize that. Um, and I would like to say that if you are interested in reviewing any of the resources that we develop around mental health, please sign up with a Community Voice because that is the way we go in and we say, who wants to review some mental health documents? And we go through to see who's interested. So if that is something that would interest you, please sign up that way. In 2018, we focused on substance misuse. Opioid addiction has been in the news throughout the United States. And just because you have CF doesn't mean that you're immune to this. Um, we worked with subject matter experts to build a, uh, a video, and that was presented at the North American Conference to mental health providers, mental health coordinators. Um, and then we broke up that video, and it's posted on CFF.org. There's a very sad story from a mom who had a child with CF, but she didn't lose her to CF. She lost her to substance abuse. And so there is also... Um, a success story, a young woman who dealt with substance abuse and she reached out, she got help, and she is continuing on her journey and uh, with the help of her mental health coordinator. And uh, that video is up on CFF.org as well. I was happy to hear Summer talk about um, procedural anxiety, because we are already thinking about that and working on that, and that will be our next video posted on CFF.org. Um, and it will be not only for adults, but there will also be some work for um, patients, I mean, pediatric patients and families. And we will focus on that, and we're looking forward to that and posting that to the website. So you will see more of that in 2019. And now... We, I want Ginger to share with you a resource that she has championed for you and uh, wanted to come up and talk about that. Thank you. So I am really, really, really excited to get to share this with you. Um, Paula will agree that this has been a labor of love um, to get this, this handout, which is on your table, if you, you want to go ahead and look at that. Um, into your hands. I think at conferences we come and we get lots of handouts, lots of pieces of paper. I always keep them because I love to read them. I check them out on the plane. But I never know really where they started, where they came from, who it was, what group, what committee that, that used your input um, to put this together. So this is for siblings of someone that's, that's living with CF or has CF in their life. And I'll tell you from my own experience, I have King who's seven, he has cystic fibrosis, and I have Emma Virginia who is 10, who has not been diagnosed with cystic fibrosis, but it's very, very much a part of her life. So in our family unit, I started to realize pretty quickly that we were all very affected by this disease, whether we were living with it in our own body or just living in it within our family unit. And for Emma Virginia, it's been quite difficult. Her brother was in the hospital over these recent months for 28 days collectively. And, you know, she started to say things like little things that I just hadn't thought about. Gosh, he got so many balloons. There's so many balloons that he got. And a couple of people, you know, would, would send some things that were really thinking, like, okay, we, we would also want to focus on Emma Virginia. She could be sad that her brother's getting all of this attention. But no matter, you know, what we try to do and what kind of focus we have, the truth is I am never going to have the same kind of really focused, intense attention for her that I do for King because... 
I don't have a medical concern for her specifically. So there are really intense things that I have to focus on with her that I just, or for him, that I just don't have to focus on with her. And it's very noticeable to a child. Siblings in general, most of the time, have pretty dynamic relationships, right? It can be really sticky, like all of us that have relationships, it can be sticky, but especially for siblings. And so for a child that has a sibling with cystic fibrosis, it's so difficult. Um, and so we found this resource and decided to put it together in a way that would really make an impact on the cystic fibrosis community. And we are excited to hand it off to you. This is actually, you're only the second group that's getting to see this. We did this session earlier and they were really the first people to get to see this document. This isn't yet to your mental health coordinators. It's not in the clinics yet. It's not on the website. So um, we're just excited to get to share it with you and get your feedback. And we hope that it's something that you as, as champions in this community will take back um, and share with people and find ways that it really can be used and used well and that you will continue to give us your feedback on it. But it was a pleasure to get to work on this, not just because um, in a, in a personal sense, I saw it as something that's so important, but I'm sure many of you would agree that once you become a part of the CF family, uh, it's not your own children that you're only worried about. It's your, it's your friend's children. Um, and yes, this is, this is focused on pediatrics, but as a community, we worry about one another in many, many ways. So this is, this is one sliver of that community that had yet to really have a focus. So this is a start of that, and it's a way that, that we hope you'll be able to take it home and use it. Thank you. I'm going to be really honest. This was really all Ginger's doing. She brought it to the committee. She brought it to the committee. She found it. She said, I think that we can adapt this to CF. Uh, she contacted the original authors. We helped her contact them. She asked them for permission. Um, and she worked with a number, another member on the committee to adapt it and make it really work for all of you. And when we say it's hot off the presses, it's not even off the presses. <laughs> It's at the printer right now, so these are, were just off copiers. So um, it really is very, very new, and we're thankful that we were able to turn it over to you and have you have a look. Speaking of turning it over to you, now it's your turn. Now we're going to take some questions, comments, suggestions. This is for you. So come on up to the um, microphone, please. Just a comment and a big thank you. Um, we started with CF in 1974 when my daughter was six. She was diagnosed and then my son was born six weeks later. We had a middle son and we had no idea we were leaving him out. None. Uh, I mean, he was part of our family. We did everything we could, but he was definitely, we had two sick kids. Yeah. We had to do chest physical therapy on them. We had to, you know, make sure they went to the doctors. We did, um, he, he hated us for a long time. Uh, he's 46 now, and we're just getting into a, a reasonable relationship with him, but it'll never be the same as with our other kids. Uh, and this sort of thing would have been immensely helpful. So thank you. And uh, I'd, I'd like to sign up for Community Voice just to tell parents that you can do it. I, I've spoken to some people in Albuquerque, we're from New Mexico, and uh, people have come up to me years later and said, thank you so much for telling me to take care of my other kid. Mm -hmm. uh, it makes a huge difference. This is wonderful, thanks. Yeah. Very difficult, thank you. Somebody online asked, at what age do you start seeing mental health problems that could be helped with therapy and meds? And are symptoms different in kids with depression? Um, we, the recommendation only goes down to 12 years old to screen for anxiety and depression. However, um, of course, you can see anxiety, and especially procedural anxiety, much younger than that. So um, that would be the answer to that question. It could be 
I, I don't think that you can say what age does it start, but it can go um, very young. Somebody wanted to know, actually, somebody want, has a question for you, not for me. So you go ahead up to, the, <laughs> up to the mic and tell us, how did they join the CF Dads group? Oh, yeah. uh, it's on Facebook. Just search for CF Dads. Um, go on there and just request to join. Uh, it's a group. There's a lot of memes, a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> I actually just bought a CF Dads t-shirt while I was sitting here. Um, but just ask to request, search for it on Facebook. And... Uh, uh, there, there's definitely sharing that gets happened in there, but definitely not to the extent uh, that the moms group has. Um, it, it, we make light of it, but I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's still difficult for men to have those conversations with other men. Uh, and I think that's where the, the peer connect can be such a, a wonderful thing. It is, you, it's anonymous, you know, it's quiet, but if you've ever thought about getting involved or if you're even just having any sort of issues, I would really, really encourage you, even if it's just questions, frustrations, and you just need a one phone call to vent, please sign up, get in touch with somebody so that you can get that because the last thing we need is, is more men and adults out there that are dealing with these things that they're not getting off their chest and that then doesn't allow us to be the best person that we can be for our kids and our loved ones. Yeah, thanks, Drew. I just wanted to say, um, I think the sibling thing is awesome and we have three boys and our youngest has cystic fibrosis, but um, just a couple of weeks ago, our chapter had a parent education um, or our hospital, our clinic had a parent education night, and they had a panel of siblings, um, and that was the topic that night. And so they had three, four, five siblings, and our oldest son was um, contacted about, I mean, our middle son was contacted about being on this panel. And I think it was really great angle, and they mm -hmm. had different age ranges of these siblings, and it was well-received. And I think just to reach out, maybe that's a good topic for some of your parent education Nice. It was very well received. Thank you for sharing that. That's a great idea. Hi, my name's Marilyn. I'm from Oregon. Our son is 31 and living a, a relatively healthy life, married um, for three years. Um, so I just wanted to comment one just huge applaud for what you've done um, in addressing mental health in, these, in this area. Um, and then I wanted to comment about where in your future, where you might go. And one of the things that we coped with is, in terms of the decisions we made, is that um, having CF in our life impacted our family composition and the way we decided to complete our family. Um, and, it's, and it's been wonderful. But those are huge decisions that we were making in a very you know, solo, silo kind of um, issue. And then there were years, I suspect I'm not the only one that might say this out loud, where we held our marriage together by a thin thread and the use of a number of mental health providers and would never expect to place that on the CF clinic, but um, would have perhaps been an, a helpful place where somebody could have invited us to acknowledge that, whoops, and then to refer us. So just a thought for that. Having been a divorced parent, of two kids with CF, um, I am starting to work with the foundation to try to identify like tips for people that are going through divorce, um, very practical things as well as how to handle it with your child um, that has CF and how do you manage two households. So, because I, the, the incidence of divorce is very high mm -hmm. in our population. So we are starting to work on that. Um, just, just literally like just started talking about it today. So. That's great. Thank you. I wanted to put a plug in also for CF Foundation CARES events. Those are ways that you all can get together. It is not a support group. We want to make sure that we say that. It's not a support group, but it is a way for you to connect with one another. So plug in for CF CARES event. Um, I'm staff speaking for some CF moms back in South Carolina. Um, and uh, the CF Peer Connect program starts at 16. Um, and we're finding a lot of tweens and early teens that really need to connect with someone, um, you know, in their peer group and what that looks like, a kid connect type situation. And I was just wondering if there's any thought. Yeah, there, they to... are. The CF peer, the community partnerships are working on that. And Danielle is going to tell you all about it. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. We've heard that a lot. Um, and so we're working on trying to identify what that program could look like. We don't know if it's exactly 
if it is lowering the age of what we currently have or if it's something brand new. We've also heard from a lot of parents about what they want for their teens, but we haven't heard from the teens, and sometimes that's a little different. So we're working on trying to get um, some teens together that we can talk to. We've had several, um, several group calls, and we're gonna have some more group calls later this year of getting teens together. So if you know of teens, it's cff.org slash teen sign up. Um, the teen signs up, and then you put in an email. Um, I don't think right now, I'll have to check. I think it's 12. Okay. Um, That's the age that. Here, I have it open right here. That. 13 and 18. 13 and 18. So 13. Walking into middle school is where okay. pretty much all of our South Carolina. So you said walking into middle school 11, is 12. the tough time. Yeah, that's, that's okay. been the big one. 11, 12. Okay. Yeah. Well, if you have any 13 to 18 year olds to sign up, <laughs> that would be awesome because we're looking for more people to talk to. I actually have a question. Another one. Sorry, I'm totally dominating. I, I apologize. <laughs> no, Daniel, this is actually for oh. you. Um, I know we do a lot of educational stuff through webinars and through connections. Uh, you know, we've done some self-care things. What, is there any plans of doing some, some formal education for parents on what to be looking for and how they can practically deal with these things if they see warning signs at home outside of just in clinical research stuff? Or is that, is that a plan? Is that... No, but that's a great idea. That's a great yes. suggestion, and I think we're going to take it back. I like that idea a lot. I think it would be very worthwhile. Somebody online, Chris, asked um, about the handouts, the sibling handout, and just so that that person knows it's not yet on the website, it will be on the website. But Chris, um, is there a way that they get handouts online? Is there any platform? Okay, so, so that person needs to just look a little bit further that it should have been loaded. All right, so the sibling handout for that person that asked should should be available to you on this platform here. Um, go ahead. Um, last year during FamilyCon, there was a great breakout session that had uh, a panel of siblings, and it was a great discussion, and I really hope that whoever's putting together FamilyCon for this year, you're doing it again? Yeah. It's a great one, so. Okay. Great. It's always great to hear um, that what you've done has been well received and that they're doing it again. Um, I second what they're saying about all the cons and actually everything that's being done through the foundation directly, I find for myself and my adult child has been far more helpful than the things we've gotten through our center. But that brings up a couple of issues, one of which is in the centers, they're not necessarily asking adults how they're doing in their own relationships and marriages and things, so they're not mm -hmm. supporting so they were talking about high rate of divorce, which I'm also in that category, but also people who are not developing relationships or having trouble in their own relationships. They may not even know or be aware of what those problems are from the, their spouse or partner's perspective. The other thing is that access to affordable, appropriate care you can refer people out all you want. If you live in a major city in this country, and I don't care what uh, chronic illness you have or what other issues you have, it is very hard to get in with a mental health mm -hmm. professional who has the appropriate background for your situation. Usually there's like, oh, it'll be six months, we're not taking patients, whatever. But also in the mental health community, a lot of them won't deal with the insurance company and ask for money up front. Um, so being referred off is one thing, but is there a plan to sort of close that loop more so that the person who's being referred who's already having an issue isn't having to spend a ton of legwork trying to find appropriate, affordable access to that kind of care? Yeah, that is an issue, you know, as you point out, with beyond CF, right? It's an issue. Um, but we hope that perhaps the telebehavioral health will be something that can be utilized. Maybe, it, you know, we still have to look to see. Maybe we have sort of regional where people um, can do that way or they're also working with um, policy and advocacy. It is difficult. It is a challenge because it's not just an RCF community. I will say that the education and um, training work group often heard that um, it was difficult if you were referred to a mental health provider and then they didn't know about CF and then you were spending your first two sessions teaching them about CF. So what we provided and 
put together was a PowerPoint that we hoped that care teams would bring to that mental health provider just so that they could learn about CF. And we also submitted a manuscript um, to a peer review journal that hopefully we can spread the news and share that information broadly throughout the mental health community. Hi. Um, first, I want to say this is fabulous. You guys have done a great, great job. Um, I lost my son, Mitch, a year and a half ago. Um, but when he was a teenager, he went through all of that stuff and in his early 20s, substance misuse, depression. I mean, it was so rampant. And I'm sure our older son went through a lot of anxiety issues as well that we never even identified. And thank God he's sane and good and well-adjusted and probably better than most of us. But, but my question is probably even a little bit different because um, Mitch had uh, twin boys, has twin boys, and the boys are now 15, almost 16 years old. And they ha are having a lot of issues in dealing with the loss of their dad and just really understanding it and processing it and, uh, and really very um, isolated in many ways. And I would love to have them get more involved from a peer connect situation, but it's a question of how if you have any suggestions, how would you get, you know, it's not like they're saying, we want to talk to somebody. So how do you propose it to them that maybe this would be helpful for them to talk to someone? Yeah, that, that's difficult, isn't it? Um, sometimes it's in modeling that behavior. Um, sometimes it's, I don't know if you have anybody that they, some, anybody else in the community that they can connect with. Um, that can encourage them to sign up. You know, sometimes it's just finding that right person that they listen to or that they will hear. Right? Um, that would be my only suggestion because it's it's difficult. That's a difficult age, right? Sixteen-year-old. Mm. Hi, um, I had kind of two questions in one. Um, are there any? Um, I know there are, are different ways of, of reaching people who are involved in the community because they're going to clinics or their parents are taking them or family members like that. Um, are there any resources for people who have lost a parent or people who have lost a sibling? Or I know um, my mom died 10 years ago from CF and my cousin um, is 13 and her dad has CF and my mom died at 40, and when her dad was getting to 40, she was very anxious about it because she had watched her aunt die at 40. And I'm wondering if there's any, I know kids aren't, of CF uh, patients aren't as common, obviously, as like siblings and parents, um, but is, yeah, but is there any um, resources that can reach people like that? Yeah, the short answer is not yet. Um, First, we're starting to look at resources and utilizing resources um, for the parent who has CF, how to have conversations with their child. Um, so that is the first thing that the education work group is now looking into. But that, that's a very good suggestion, and we'll bring that back to the committee. You don't know of anything, do you? Yeah, I I do. yeah me too. Um, I just had a flash. Not a hot one. <laughs> I'm beyond that. <laughs> um, but the procedural anxiety, um, everybody goes through that. Everybody with any chronic illness. My daughter passed away 10 years ago. She went through the whole uh, lung transplant qualification. She never could make it because her rejection ratio was in the 90s. Um, but she was very, very anxious about it. She did have good support. Uh, I don't know if anybody knows Jennifer Taylor Kowser mm -hmm. in Denver, Denver. She was in Albuquerque, thank God, when Ann was there, and she was amazingly supportive. But prior to that, she had a big time, hard time. Ann had a hard time when she was about 20. She had to get a port, and she thought that was the end game. You know, this is, I can't use my arms anymore. What am I going to do? She got the port. She loved it. Yeah. She couldn't believe how much it was. She wrote a poem about it called Ode to My Port. It's out on the web. I'll send it to you if you want it. But the other one that I, I thought about, which I, I don't know if people think about it, my son Tom 
got a fear of needles when he was about four. Now, what do you do with that? This kid's going to get stuck every couple of months for the rest of his life. Um, <laughs> it was kind of funny. We would walk into the clinic, and all the nurses would leave for lunch because they would have to hold them down. It was pathetic. I remember one time holding him, and I was crying myself. He was screaming. Um, and finally, <laughs> it's kind of silly, but... He was about nine. Two things happened. One, I talked to him about the Lama's relaxation techniques. He seemed to get it. That wasn't the pure cure. But then he had to go in front of his cousins to get, a blood, get his blood drawn. And they were two little girls. He didn't want to be, you know, a wimp in front of these girls. So he stood up and got a needle. That was his first one that he didn't cry for. And from then on, he didn't cry. But, you know, maybe... I don't know what you could put up there, but maybe it's in the peer-to-peer -peer connect. But parents have to deal with that sort of thing all the time. And uh, uh, how do you deal with them? And, and, and I mean, we went through five years of holding them down, which was horrendous. Yeah, it, so, that is horrendous. And yeah. both of the scenarios that you bring up are common, I yeah, have to say. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we hope that with that procedural anxiety, with those videos, putting them on the web, that they will be accessed by, by any of you yeah. at any time. And they, they will help you help your child as well as the yeah. care teams. I'd, I'd make a suggestion, too. I, I, I'm, I'm assuming, and I don't know if it's true, that your video will be concerned with more of the big things like lung transplant. Is that true? Do you deal we, with needles in five-year-olds? Yeah. I mean, oh, actually, great, we work great. because okay. there, are, there are certain techniques that are going to be utilized no matter what okay. that procedure okay. is. Yeah. So okay. that, that's I just didn't want to miss that. I want you to miss that part of it. It's a big part. No. Right, Thank thanks. you. Thank you for your comments. Yes. I think you bring up um, a, a great point, an unfortunate one, but a good one. So yes, like in procedural anxiety and in these videos, it's so important to, um, to focus on that and find ways for children and even adults, young adults, to, to get through that a little bit easier. But um, again, like hearing a story and it gives you a flash and all of that, um, hearing you talk about, you know, like holding your child down and all of that, it, it makes me think of my own experience. And so I would just, for any parents or even a sibling or a, a child of someone with cystic fibrosis, that you're dealing with that for someone that you love, that stress is a lot for you too. And um, again, with the Peer to Peer Connect, I feel like we've talked about that so much today. But there could be someone there, you know, for, for you to talk to them about that. But I, there are so many levels of this that are very hard, you know, and there are so many stressors on so many people that I just, this is fantastic that everyone's sharing here, but I would urge you to continue sharing those things and having those conversations and removing that stigma when you go home, too. And this is our last question. Okay. It's actually not a question. It's just sharing some resources. Um, there is a resource with CFRI, um, the Cystic Fibrosis Research Institute, um, or Incorporated. They have a mindfulness-based stress reduction class that is available, and it's actually taught by Julie Desch, who had, is an adult with CF. And it's a virtual class. So you take it online, and I took the class. And it's like every Saturday and I think maybe a weeknight. And it teaches you the, the concepts behind um, mindfulness-based stress reduction. There is also a free counseling that you can apply for through CFRI. You can get six uh, therapy sessions, either your child or a parent. Um, that has CF or the you know the parent of someone with CF, and it's you get six sessions for free. And here in San Diego, the therapist came to our house for free, and that was invaluable um, for both of us, for both of my children and myself. So there are resources out there that can help with the practical issues. Um, but I find like we need like like I have the Calm app on my phone that helps me, and I have things for kids. If they are nervous about getting a procedure done, they have like different like five minute relaxation techniques and, and things like that. So little tips and tricks like that I think are um, really helpful. We're at time. Thank you so much. I think those are, are great examples. Could I make one more comment? 
Are we? Okay, the, the other thing that I just would say is wherever it is that you're finding resources, wherever it is that you think you need me more resources, deeper resources, um, just be sure that you're using your voice, right? Like at your care center, when you're here with the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, the more that you share um, that this is a priority for you and that you feel that this is a true need that is being met, but we can continue to do more with, I would just urge you to do that. But thank you so much for being here with us. Paula, do you have anything else? I just wanted to thank you all for your attention and for your comments. We really do take them to heart. So enjoy, and I hope everybody has a safe trip home. Bye-bye.